Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you decided to join us. Our guest today is Jeffrey Lacker. Jeff worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond from 1989 to 2017 and was its president from 2004 to 2017. Jeff is now also a senior affiliated scholar at the Mercatus Center and therefore is a colleague of mine. Jeff joins us today to talk about Fed governance. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Uh, my pleasure. Great to be with you and great to be a colleague of yours. Yeah, it's great to have you on the Monetary Policy Project team. We're all delighted. We had you on last time on the show talking about the Richmond Fed tradition. I encourage listeners to go back and check out that program. Uh, but we now have you. We have Bob Hetzel. So I think we're going to rename part of our program the Richmond Fed wing of the Mercatus Center. <laughs> Uh, both of you are doing great work. Bob's been with us a few years. You came on late last year, and now you're a senior affiliated uh, scholar. And we want to talk about one of the pieces you just put out. In fact, the piece you just put out, you presented at a conference we had for Bennett McCollum, who was another affiliated scholar with Richmond Fed. So uh, Bennett McCollum, a big fan of his. In fact, I still have that that poster from the conference on my wall in the office. But great guy, rules-based, fan of nominal GDP targeting, understood credit, money issues well. And you have this great tradition at the Richmond Fed we talked about again last time. And so we are excited to continue that conversation in, in terms of governance today. Well, it's uh, great to be part of uh, merging these, these uh, institutions with two great intellectual heritages. It was a real honor to be invited to participate in the conference honoring Bennett McCallum. When I first came to the Richmond Fed in 1989, he was a visiting scholar there. And so for the next decade or so, I uh, got to interact with him fairly often when he was there. He used to be at UVA and then he went to Carnegie Mellon, but just very fond of him. He made great contributions in the 70s, 80s, and 90s to monetary economics and, and even into the 2000s, but also just a great guy to be around the soft Southern Texas drawl and Great demeanor, but also, you know, incisive mind and uh, didn't hold back. So uh, a great guy. Yeah. And again, I encourage listeners to go check out the conference. We'll provide links in the show notes. We also had a podcast from that conference where I, I chatted with Ed Nelson about some of the personal side of, of Bennett McCollum. So it's so fascinating to learn he was an athlete. He, uh, he did a student newspaper, and I joked it prepared him for being editor of the AEA. He could reject articles easy because he did that in high school. Um, his his wife was there too. She really appreciated it. Just there's a, there, It's really neat to see the personal side of prominent economists and, and then also to consider all the work that they have done. And of course, it was great to have you there and a bunch of other people. Governor Waller was there. Just as a great, great day. So I encourage folks to go back and check it out. But you gave a presentation there that was uh, both interesting and provocative. Uh, and and so I'm, I'm excited to chat about it today. And the title of the policy brief that came out of that talk is Governance and Diversity at the Federal Reserve. And I want to begin by reading just the, the first two paragraphs, and then I'll turn it over to you. But it's, it's a great motivation, great way to start things off. So you say, the purpose of good governance is good outcomes. From that perspective, the recent surge in inflation and the Federal Reserve System's delayed response in 2021 and early 2022 must be central to any discussions of the future Fed governance. Several Fed le leaders have since expressed regret regarding the delay, and a strong case can be made that the Fed's decisions to hold off responding was a significant error given what they knew at the time. For example, in a 2023 Brookings Institution's conference paper, authors Gotti Ergotson and Don Cohn argued that earlier recognition by the Fed of the seriousness of the inflation surge and earlier response to the surge likely would have dampened demand sooner, lessened the increase in inflation, and enabled a more gradual tightening of policy. Many factors have been cited as contributing to the Fed's disappointing performance. You go through and list a few, then you say, could the recent evolution of Fed governance practices also have contributed to the Fed's performance? 
I would argue that this possibility is worth serious consideration. In particular, I would point to the change in the role of the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve System in the search for the Federal Reserve Bank presidents, the seemingly shifting norms around public dissensions by FOMC members, and the nature of the board's entanglement in the legislative response to COVID-19 pandemic. So you outlined three possibilities, the three ways that Fed governance could have contributed to this outcome. So Walk us through those, and let's let's start with that first one, the evolving governance at the Federal Reserve System. How did that play a role, do you think, in this story? Yeah, so I, I start with the observation that the, the nature of the composition of the presidents of the Reserve Bank System now versus, I, I take this benchmark 2009, and I think things changed like right then, right, right around the end of 2009, end of 2010. I think that you can note a, a distinct difference. So a lot of us back then were, were relatively outspoken. We're willing to speak in public and describe alternative perspectives on the current policy outlook, uh, describe different points of view about where policy should go. That was in part kind of an outgrowth of the transparency movement that Ben Bernanke was responsible for, which I think has been a very, very good thing for the Federal Reserve System. Under Greenspan, you may recall, the um, the committee was relatively closed. People didn't speak at all in a way that was you could easily infer something about their policy views. Greenspan was deferred to as the spokesperson for the committee's views and for his views about where policy was going. His views would would come out in a, a relatively cloaked and, and indirect way. But then Bernanke came in with you know the, the natural modern economist view that transparency is better and makes for better policy and makes for better understanding of the Fed. And so he kind of loosened the reins on us, both within the committee meetings. So the, you look at the transcript and there's a lot more free-flowing discussion after Bernanke came in. I mean, it's not a seminar by any means, but he tolerated people expressing other views at length within the committee meetings. And it translated outside of the committee in terms of just allowing people to say what they thought uh, in some sense. But uh, something shifted in 2009. We can talk about uh, why that might have been. But the other observation I have, so if you look in 2009, the uh, number of presidents, there were six or seven presidents who had, if you looked at their CV, they had published in academic journals in the areas of monetary and macroeconomics. Uh, there were seven in 2009. And then, you know, by the end of, you know, 2022, there were just two. And now there's just one, Williams, and he's a relatively centrist character. He's sort of in, inside the, the troika or whatever they call it that, that, you know, that guides monetary policy. So you have fewer voices on the committee that you know have the background in academic economics that that would you know i'd argue that that would give you a little more confidence in speaking your mind in the committee and a little more confidence in voicing alternative views outside now that's by no means a prerequisite you have institutions like the Kansas City Fed and the St. Louis Fed where the strong tradition of taking their independent role seriously has led to people who aren't, you know, PhD economists or, you know, not publishing in macro and monetary policy. Uh, like I said, it, you know, people outside of the traditional macro background being willing to take independent stand. But it, it does seem to me like an indicator that that might correlate with willingness to take a, a, a different point of view in public. So I, I start with that observation that the composition of the committee is changed. And so I, in thinking about what might have brought that about, so I, I was there from 04 to 07 as a president you know, at the Richmond Fed back in 89. So I have experience with my search, and I've seen other searches, including the one for my successor. And I'm not knocking those searches, but one thing that stands out to me is that around 2010, the Board of Governors seems to take a much stronger and more active role in the search compared to my experience and what I know the experience of some other 
colleagues from back in the 2000s. So I, the way I characterize it in the paper, I think this is fair, but you know, someone can contradict me if they have other evidence. Back before 2010, the search involved the chair of the search committee, usually the chair of the, the board of directors of the Reserve Bank, calling and, and, and having a consultation with the chair of what's called the Bank Affairs Committee. This is the, the group of the governors that oversees Reserve Bank Affairs. And the chair of the Bank Affairs Committee is the one who's generally on point to interact with the reserve banks during the searches. Uh, the reserve banks, of course, they're independent corporations. And the act says that they appoint the president and the first vice president, and the language is subject to the approval of the board of governors. And I think that language was interpreted as the, the board of the reserve bank takes the lead on the search and towards the end of the process checks in with uh, the board of governors uh, via the bank affairs committee chair. Now, in, in theory, the reserve bank could just pick someone and send the name up. But in generally what it, what, what happened is that they got to the point where they were about where they had chosen who they wanted to appoint, but they didn't take a formal vote. They consulted. Well, we're about to, to name this person. We're about to appoint this person. How would you guys feel about that? And they'd get a signal back from the board of governors like, yeah, this will fly or no, this won't fly. And in the latter case, then, you know, sometimes there's a confrontation, sometimes there's negotiation, sometimes it's sent back for a redo. But it was a it was at the end that the board got, you know, more intimately involved. That may have varied at various times, but that's generally my impression of how the process worked. In contrast, now it, it seems like it virtually co-management. There are very regular calls, very regular consultations. The reserve banks will send early lists of candidates that will get vetted at the board. The board will send in names of its own to the reserve bank search process. The board will steer them away from certain candidates. You know, the, the watchword is, well, they need to be mainstream economists. Um, so they want to, you know, screen out cranks, obviously. But, you know, the question that arises is, does that emphasis on mainstream economists or mainstream policymakers, does that in some way sort of filter out people that have just diverging views, you know, legitimate alternative perspectives on the way policy is conducted? And I suspect it it, it has. And I, I suspect uh, but this is just a conjecture. This is what I call it in the paper. I, I suspect that that's led to the selection of people that on the whole have a stronger alignment with the Board of Governors' views, and in addition, less of a propensity to express dissenting views, at least outside the committee. So that's my conjecture about the governance process, that it's shifted. And we can talk about why, but that's that's something I think that's happened over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's talk about why, and, and I'm just going to throw out there, the politicization of the Fed, like every other federal institution, seems to be playing a role. And I'm going to mention some research that was done by Carola Binder and Christina Paragon Skinner. They're both academics. They had a, a I think it was a law journal paper, but they also had a policy brief for us. It was a derivative of that. And what they documented is that coming out of the regional banks, they looked at all of them, that an increasing share of the research is on progressive topics, so climate change, inequality, things that are important but better addressed by Congress, in my view. Congress has the tools to address those, those problems, but an increasing share of the research is being done on that, which, which I think kind of complements or echoes this point you made earlier about having Federal Reserve presidents who are truly monetary economists, now you're getting ones that maybe they may not be their area of expertise. And so you see, I guess what I'm painting is a picture where you're seeing the regional Federal Reserve banks kind of reflecting broader trends in society. I mean, even the economic profession, right? That Those topics are, are topics that get you published in journals today too. So is, do you see something like that happening or playing a role in this change? 
Yeah, I, that that could well be. I think it's a symptom of the same sort of process. So the the political climate around the Fed has evolved a lot in the last 50 years. There was the inflation disaster of the 70s, Volcker. There was a monetary mystique. Uh, the Fed cultivated this sort of, one author called it secrets of the temple kind of point of view. You know, we're technocratic experts, but we hold the cards close to our vest. But in the course of the 80s and the 90s, as central banks around the world began coping with this new environment in which we're not tethered to gold and it's all on the central bank to maintain price stability and keep inflation low and stable. Central banks around the world realized that it was really valuable to have the public understand what they're trying to do, understand their commitment and their determination to keep inflation low and stable. So I, you had more and more move towards transparency over the course of the 80s and 90s. That took different forms and it was a little halting. But then you had the rise of cable news in the 90s, and it was 24-7 attention to what the Fed's going to do next. And I, that kind of continues now. But then in the financial crisis, the Fed undertook some very controversial, unprecedented actions in its intervention in credit markets, rescuing investors in Bear Stearns, or you know, assisting the merger in Bear Stearns. You had Lehman Brothers, you had AIG, you had Wachovia and its merger with Wells, its Citigroup, all sorts of intervention by the Fed that brought sharp political attacks from both the left and the right. You had Occupy Wall Street, and you had on the left, and you had the House Republicans uh, carping on the Fed uh, from the right. And so the Fed was under a microscope and in a hostile political environment. I think that's in that context. Having critics be able to identify people who are inside the institution expressing alternative views was very politically inconvenient for the Board of Governors in dealing with Congress, because those type of critics have a different kind of stature than someone from outside. They have access to the same analysis, presumably the same data. I think that's the motivating factor behind this turn towards getting more involved in the selection of reserve bank presidents. The thing that it, the cost it has is that the, the reserve banks have always been the source of useful, independent thinking and research in monetary economics. And a, a paper by Michael Bordo and Ned Prescott, Ned Prescott's at the Cleveland Fed, but Michael Bordo, the economic historian, has documented the role of the reserve banks in very important advances in, in monetary economics and the practice of monetary policy over the years. But as the Fed's gotten more attention, like corporations all over America, it has this incentive to respond in a way that, that heightens the demonstration of its understanding of and concern for uh, the, the interests of a broad range of people. So the Fed's demonstrating that it understands climate policy. It's demonstrating that it understands inequality uh, in economic outcomes. And demonstrating that is part of cultivating a, you know, a goodwill on um, part of the electorate uh, that I think is a response to the heightened political pressure and to the Fed taking undertaking really distributional fiscal policy actions when it lends to the markets. Yeah, and I, th I think the reason we should think about this development and, and maybe be concerned about it is that it does raise questions about the Fed's independence. You know, if, if the Fed continues to be politicized, and, and, and maybe what you're saying is that they have to show they're interested in climate change. They have to show they're interested in inequality. And, and maybe, you know, they're just kind of throwing a, a bone to the dog, keep the different constituents happy. But the, the problem is, is we do more and more of that. And if we have swings in elections from Democrats to Republican, I mean, you can imagine a world where we get a President Trump and he goes after the Fed for these very things, right? And, and further politicizes the Fed. So that's that's my concern is, is that we may be making the Fed more enabled by responding to these various constituencies 
in the near term, but over the long term, it might actually undermine independence of the Fed. The the other, I guess, thing I would I would bring up here is just to play the devil's advocate. So I imagine someone on the other side would say, yes, yes, but but what about you know the these presidents that they have their research staffs, right? So even if they're not true monetary economists, even if they look like they're politicized, when push comes to shove, they've got smart monetary economists around them that advise them. Um, in fact, if you, you know, go back a year or so ago, they were really focused laser-like on inflation, right? They, uh, some people joke the Fed had one mandate, you know, a few years back because of inflation. And they put aside in full employment, these other things. And so, you know, when push comes to shove, they really do act like monetary economists. So uh, how would you respond to that observation? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a valid point to cite the strength of the Reserve Bank research departments, but it's up to each president to decide how he and her or her are, you know, going to use their department. You know, what use do they make of them? How deeply do they get involved in the department? How the, how much do they learn from them? How much time do they spend with them? And, you know, I think it's just inevitably human nature that, you know, the more deeply you live and breathe a subject, the more confident you are about your assessments confident about your ability to absorb and evaluate and discriminate among the advice you get from various advisors. Because, you know, if, if you're good, you have a department with diverse views and they don't all tell you the same thing. And so you have to kind of sort through things for yourself. So I, I take the point, but I think still having a, you know, having a background and, deep, and deeply engaging in your research department are, are more conducive to having the confidence to express an alternative view. Of course, I mean, the other criticism is that, you know, one person's confidence is another man's hubris, but I'll, I'll leave that for a different discussion. Okay. W- one last observation on this particular point in your essay regarding the appointment and selection of Federal Reserve presidents is recently the Chicago Fed president search process. Two of the governors actually voted I believe it was absent when when it came to the board approving the Chicago Fed president. I believe Governor Chris Waller, Michelle Bowman, they voted absent, which it made headlines. Right? It was it was a pretty interesting development. They didn't vote against, but they didn't show their support either. So, how do you interpret that development? You know, I I think the Chicago appointment was striking uh, because it was Austin Goolsbee with a partisan policy making background and the fed has a history of trying to remain as nonpartisan as possible i remember 20 years ago or so stories coming out that one of the presidents had made a political contribution to a candidate and it was somewhat scandalous that he'd made a political contribution to a candidate i mean and you know the records show that hardly anyone else had and and it was kind of a part of the norms of the institution that you stayed away from signaling endorsement of one party or another, either in a Senate campaign or governor, or especially in the national office. So this does seem like a watershed kind of crossing a red line for the Fed uh, to countenance appointing somebody who served in, you know, one party's White House. You know, it, it could turn out okay, could be fine. But it is a change in the norms, and I could I could understand being a, a bit concerned about that if I was on the board of governors. So the concern is if we appoint people who are known for their political views, um, been, have been very active in policy circles, that it's going to jeopardize the Fed's independence. Because at some point in the future, again, you might have someone come to power who doesn't like what the Fed's doing. They can point a finger at this person or that person. Well, they're clearly on the other team, and therefore we should reconsider how the Fed operates and maybe rewrite the Federal Reserve Act or do something along those lines. That's, that's, I think that's the concern. Okay, let's move on to your second point in your essay, and that's the evolving communication norms, the public dissension by FOMC members. What is your issue there? Well, I was struck towards the end of 2021. It, it dawned on me that you had a lot of economists outside of the Fed that were very concerned about inflation, very concerned about the delay in the Fed, the Fed 
raising rates to fight inflation. And it all of a sudden, I realized that I hadn't heard any dissenting views from anybody within the FOMC, that the FOMC had had been relatively quiet in public about that. And I I just tried to picture what it would be like for me to be on the FOMC. And, you know, in 2008 and 2009, I was uh, respectful, but, you know, not reticent about expressing a different view about the, the, the board and the New York Fed's credit market interventions. So I was, I was, as I reflected on it, it just seemed as if it, the appearance uh, was there that the, committee was uh, sticking to kind of the house view in public. And that, that struck me as notable, as very different than my experience in 2009, 2010, 2011, when there was a lot of controversy about Fed policy and a lot of us spoke out in public about it. So it, it seems to me plausible that it's a deliberate outcome of a change in the, the chairman's attitude uh, towards this. I described the shift from Greenspan to Bernanke. I'm guessing that Chair Powell prefers the operations and the norms of a corporate board in which, you know, maybe you dissent internally, you express different views within the committee walls, or maybe even not then because it shows up on the transcript with a five year lag, but that outside you, you know, you, you present a united front. I, I'm suspecting, and I don't have any evidence of this besides the observation that public dissenting views seem to have declined. But I'm suspecting that this is this is Powell's approach uh, to the communication norms within the Fed. Now, you're not the only person to notice this. You note in your essay that uh, Gotti Ergenson and Don Cohn also <laughs> make this observation. Is that right? Yeah, they wrote a great paper, a real detailed analysis of the effect of the adoption of the 2021 uh, framework, uh, new new Fed policy framework, uh, and the forward guidance they they dropped just the month later in September 2020. The effect of that on this delay in fighting inflation in 2021 and 2022. The last sentence of their paper, though, is last couple sentences. Really. Um, the FOMC has had a very consensus-driven decision process. The committee should ask itself whether different aspects of its decisions and decision-making are allowing sufficient scope for effective challenges to the majority view. And that's un- that sentence is underlined in a number of other ways as well. But I thought that was striking coming from, you know, Gauti, a very mainstream economist, and Don Cohn. A longtime Fed veteran. I mean, he started at the Kansas City Fed in 1967, went to the board in 74, I think it was, you know, was on the board of governors as vice chair, very influential as a, you know, a a director of one of the research divisions, very much committed to the Federal Reserve System, but very, I I think, you know, bold and, and, you know, I think on target here. Yeah, it, it is pretty striking. That he signed his name to that <laughs> sentence. Let me just add something here about Don Cohn. In my experience at the Federal Reserve, he is the FOMC participant who I think paid attention to, respected, acknowledged, grappled with, understood, tried to take on board dis- dissenting views with more integrity uh, than anyone anyone else I encountered. You would see him hear people's different views he would audible in the committee he wouldn't just stick to his statement he would he would articulate the views he would he would do this thing people talk about in marriage counseling about active listening you know he would articulate he would put it in their own words in his own words and and he he'd lean back and stare up at the ceiling as he did it people who know don know you know kind of what i'm talking about i think I mean, there are plenty of economists out there who've had way more contact with him in the board staff setting than I have. But the integrity with which he grappled with different views I really stood out uh, as I reflect on my FOMC experience. So I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. 
All right, your final point is the evolving relationship the Federal Reserve has with Congress tied to what they, they did during the pandemic. So speak to us about that. Well, so this goes back to a point my late colleague, uh, Marvin Goodfriend, uh, made very forcefully in the 80s and 90s. So the, the Fed can be thought of as doing two things. Uh, one is controlling the size of its liabilities. Its liabilities are monetary instruments. So it supplies um, money to the economy, and that's monetary policy, varying the quantity of that in a way it influence interest rates. The other thing it does is it has assets. It could hold all its assets in U.S. government securities, and when it varies the size of its balance sheet, it just does it by varying the size of the portfolio of government securities it holds through open market operations, they call it. So that's that's one benchmark. That would be pure monetary policy. But when the Fed decides to lend to a private institution, a bank, a financial institution, acquiring some credit instruments and in some uh, program or another, some facility, when it does that, it's doing something that is really fiscal policy. It's really different from monetary policy. Because if it expands the balance sheet, it could have expanded the balance sheet through buying treasuries only. And if it does so by lending, it's in some sense doing a two-step thing of pure monetary policy by buying treasury securities. And then in order to implement its facility, selling treasuries to the public and using the proceeds to make the loan. So in that sense, the the credit operations of the Fed are entirely separable from monetary policy. There's no reason the Fed has to do it. And indeed, in 2020, we saw the Treasury do some credit programs. So there's nothing to stop those lending programs from being done by the Fiscal Policy Authority. The difference is that if the Treasury does it, the Congress has to step in and authorize it and appropriate the money for it. If the Fed does it, it doesn't have to ask for Congress's permission. As long as it meets the the lending authority it has that's kind of left over from the old way it, it was founded and to do business, as long as it fits into one of those buckets of lending it's allowed to do, yeah, Congress doesn't have to go authorize it or, or be involved in, in setting it up. Marvin argued that credit intervention, credit market intervention is inherently controversial, inherently political, because it involves distributional questions. You're you're lowering borrowing rates for some borrowers and not for others. This involves decisions that ought to be political and that are generally controversial. And that for the Fed to get involved in that uses up scarce political capital that it may need and could need to defend itself and defend its monetary policy independence. Uh, so that his argument is that the Fed should Fed should avoid credit allocation altogether. That the Fed should have a, an accord with the Treasury that says we don't do credit policy at the Fed. You do credit policy. We do monetary policy. You leave us alone to do monetary policy and we'll leave you alone to do credit policy. Um, so that sharp separation, I think, has been for, it was for me persuasive for other economists as well. So the warning there, though, the implicit warning about political entanglements involved in credit policy, I think, are very germane here because in 2020, the Fed got very involved in the political deliberations involved in the fiscal pa- rescue packages and in the design of the credit programs that the Treasury implemented and that the Fed implemented. And in some instances, they were getting cross at cross purposes with Congress. They were Congress was writing a program and the Fed and the Treasury were writing a different program with different characteristics, different parameters. Broad brush, the Fed was urging Congress to do more on fiscal policy. And that crosses a red line that's been pr- pretty bright in recent Fed history. And that was very surprising. Greenspan famously virtually never opined about fiscal policy. And Bernanke observed that too, the idea being that's Congress's business. 
we don't want them taking away our monetary policy independence, so we won't comment on, on their business, which is fiscal policy. But he raced across that line and, and was recommending to Nancy Pelosi that they go big. And then in 2021, they enact this, this last phase of stimulus programs, and they do go big. And I think in hindsight, it's pretty clear. I think a broad range of economists would say they went too far. Now, the question that arises, did that compromise the Fed's willingness to essentially acknowledge that it went too far and do what the central bank needs to do when the fiscal policy authority goes too far and raise interest rates. Because the, you know, the essential dynamic is that there's a lot, too much money out there being spent by people. In order to balance supply and demand, you have to get people, at least with the tools the central bank has, you have to get people to delay spending. And the way to do that is to raise the reward for delaying spending, which is the real inflation-adjusted interest rate. Instead, the Fed let the real interest rate fall to negative 5 or 6% uh, when it had been maybe minus 1 or 2. Y- you wonder whether the Fed was afraid of the optics of tightening policy just after it had, a fiscal policy stimulus had been enacted that the Fed had been something of a cheerleader for. Now, those are all great points, and I want to add to those in a minute. But before I do, let, let me again play devil's advocate and take the Fed side here, just, just to be even-handed. So one could say in response to that, yes, the Fed did go too far, but it's again, it's a byproduct of our times, the politicization of Congress even. Congress can't do its job, therefore... Fed is effectively stepping up to the plate. You know, Congress is so politicized itself, it can't come together and, and do things. Of course, it, it did pass the CARES Act and did get some things done during the crisis. So one might be, just in normal time, maybe outside of the pandemic, we're putting more and more responsibility on the Fed just because Congress doesn't seem to want to do its job. I guess the second pushback might be, yes, the Fed definitely compromised its independence during this period but this is a wartime. This is a major crisis. Like maybe World War II, they did the same thing. So maybe we should view things differently. So how, how would you respond to those pushbacks? So the, the one about Congress not being able to do something seems like a, a weak re uh, to grasp here. I mean, you wouldn't want the military taking that point of view. You know, <laughs> Correct. That, that uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to go fight a war. Congress can't get its act together to declare war. So as a general matter of constitutional democracies, you don't don't want to rely on the argument that, uh, yeah, technocratic agencies should step into the breach when Congress seems paralyzed. I mean, Congress being paralyzed is an artifact of different points of view. And in a democracy, that's just something you have to deal with as a fact. But the the broader point that this this was an emergency is certainly relevant. And I, I, I take that point of view fairly. I mean, I, th- I think it was somewhat of a wartime footing we were on in, in 2020. But I think the, the responsible uh, the responsible thing to the Fed was to bring its expertise to bear and say, hey, here's, here's what we think. Here's how we can help the whole country respond. I think the Fed has to be a participant in that. And it's part of our country's economic apparatus. So yeah, it has a role to play there. Now, credit programs are one thing, right? Credit programs are not monetary policy. So on the mo- let's talk about them separately. On monetary policy, I think the Fed's got to, you know, own. If I was speaking to Congress back then, I think I you know now that like a lot of uncertainty here. It's April 2020. We're not quite sure how this is going to play out. Fiscal stimulus seems really warranted. But if it results in inflation, we're going to have to respond and we're going to have to raise real interest rates. But, you know, so you've got to get it right. Don't go too high. Don't go too low. Here's this number seems fine to us, but, you know, we could change our mind if it turns out that was too much. Um, I think that's a responsible approach to take. On credit policy, there, they're just implementing congressional programs. So if Congress wants the Fed to lend to 
small businesses and not the Small Business Administration, or it wants to lend to banks and on these terms or those terms, Congress can direct us to do that as they did in the 30s and 40s. That's up to them. If I was a Fed chair at the time, I would have said, no, why don't we lend you the expertise and you can set up a program like that in the treasury? I think that would be just fine for us. We'll buy the bonds you issue, you know, to do that, which is what the Fed ended up doing with those bonds. Anyway, so I think there was a way for the Fed to manage its engagement politically in a way that preserved its monetary policy independence. Well, and I have to say here, I'm just conjecturing. I don't know the complete, you know, conversations. Chair Powell had behind the scenes. Maybe he did warn this way. I suspect not because inflation in 2021 was so unexpected. But I think in the future, this is going to be something on the mind of any Fed chair interacting with Congress in, in such an emergency situation. So one of the things we can point to that was very interesting surrounding this conversation is the fact that the Fed has not been as vocal about fiscal deficits on the other side. In fact, Greg Epp had an article in the Wall Street Journal, and it was titled, What Can the Fed Do About Deficits? Nothing. But he goes on to say the Fed was very vocal, as you just outlined in 2020, 21, promoting it. We need it. We need it. And then in the fall of last year, when there was a lot of concern about the deficits, the quarterly refunding deals that the Treasury were doing. There was a lot of talk about term premiums shooting out because of the deficits. Now, some of that talk has died down as the 10-year yields come down some, but there was a lot of concern at that moment, and we didn't hear Chair Powell step to the mic and say, hey, Congress, you need to get these deficits in line. In fact, he said, we don't speak on matters of fiscal policy. That's what he said. And Greg Epp highlighted the, the, this tension. Like He's very eager to speak in one direction, pro-fiscal policy, but when it comes to tightening, he was very reluctant to do that. So I, I do think that that is something to, to, to note. And again, just going back to the, this bigger point, we want to minimize the chances of the Fed losing its independence in the future. So we do need, we do need to be careful during these, these moments of crisis, even though things may be different and we may be called on to do more than we normally would. All right, so that's that's your policy brief. Its title, again, is Governance and Diversity of the Federal Reserve. We'll provide a link to it in the show notes. And the time we have left, Jeff, I want to go to a presentation you gave last year at the Shadow Open Market Committee, because I think it ties into this governance thing we've been talking about. And, and the title of your talk there was Some Questions About the Fed's Monetary Policy Operating Regime. And as listeners of the show know, this is a real interesting issue for me. I love I love talking about this. So I was excited to see that you you you're talking about it too. So maybe share the highlights of that, and then we can kind of use that to talk about some of the governance issues it creates. Well, it starts from the observation that the Fed now sets four interest rates. The Board of Governors sets an interest rate on reserve balances that banks hold with the Federal Reserve Banks. The FOMC sets a rate on something called the Overnight Reverse Repurchase Agreement Facility, a repo facility. The Fed in that facility receives cash, lends out securities, at, which drains reserves from the banking system. This was adopted in the lead up to a liftoff in the mid 2010s. Um, the fear was that the Fed would raise the interest rate on reserves and other interest rates wouldn't come along. I never quite understood that fear. It was announced that if it wasn't needed, they would wind it down. And it turned out we didn't need it. But lo and behold, this, the, the facility is still there. Third, the Fed sets uh, the interest rate on a standing overnight repo facility where the Fed receives security and lends out cash that adds reserves to the banking system. It reverses it the next day or after a term. And then the Fed still sets a target for the federal funds rate. It, the target is now a range, a quarter point wide. Banks, because they earn interest on reserves at, at uh, the Fed, have no interest in trading reserves or no need to borrow or lend reserves because reserve balances are so high. Virtually all of this trading is it involves government-sponsored enterprises like the Federal Home Loan Bank's and Fannie and Freddie. So they set four interest rates. And the observation is that before the, the great financial crisis, we just set one interest rate. Uh, we set the target for the federal funds rate. We, I say we, I used to be at the Fed. 
Um, so the Fed set one interest rate and it directed the New York Fed to adjust the supply of bank reserves in the system. Um, borrowing and lending reallocated those reserves around the banking system. So the banks were happy with what they held and they adjusted the supply. So that supply equal demand at the overnight federal funds target. And nobody seemed to mind that repo rates, other interest rates would fluctuate around the Fed funds target as much as 10 or 20 basis points. That didn't seem to bother anyone. Nobody seemed to think we needed to set more than one interest rate to control the general level of interest rates in the economy. So I just started to think about this question, well, why do we set four interest rates? Well, if we set more than one, the spread between those two is something the Fed seems to have a, an opinion about. It seems to have some judgment that it wants to control the spreads, these three spreads between these four different interest rates. And it, it's not obvious why. I mean, it's not obvious why the, the, what the market would give you for the spreads between the interest rate on reserves and other things is going to be problematic. We were told this system would be easier, it'd be simpler <laughs> to implement. <laughs> and if anything, it seems like it's gotten more complicated and I've had Bill Nelson on the show a few times, and he makes the same point that, you know, it, it hasn't been easier. It hasn't been simpler. In fact, there are now more staff employed at the New York Fed to implement this than pre-2008. And he also, you know, talks about how the system has led to a ratcheting effect on reserve demand by by banks as they go on. It's not just regulations that have increased demand, but it's once you become comfortable with a certain level of reserves and your supervisor does it kind of ratchets up. And, and this is a nice segue into some of the governance issues created by this operating system. So it, 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 you know, it requires a large balance sheet, an ample reserve balance sheet or an abundant reserve, however they're framing it nowadays. But it, it also means the Fed is getting involved again in issues that could politicize it and, and affect the governance of the Fed. So one thing you know, that this system does, it, it effectively makes the Fed a meaningful player in determining, you know, the composition of the U.S. federal debt, right? It, it, it affects duration. It, it plays a role that should be done by Treasury. That's one observation I, I would note. Also, it makes the Fed susceptible to losses on the balance sheet. And we see that right now. And in many places around the world in advanced economies, this is a big conversation. You know, the ECB is reevaluating its, its operating framework You've noted that the UK has a specific system in place that to deal with such losses, but Swiss National Bank, they also have had big losses on their balance sheet. So in many places, is a big conversation and it becomes politicized, affects government issues. Bank regulations, I kind of touched on already. If you have big Fed balance sheet, banks have to hold the reserves. It affects you know what they hold in their balance sheets. So it seems to be a lot of governance issues that come along with this operating system. And and again, I, I would just stress this point. What does it do ultimately to the Fed's independence at some point down the road? Does it gradually erode it or does it strengthen it? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on governance issues related to this operating system? I, I think they're very germane. I think also germane is the, the economic rationale for these things. It's bound to be the case that these interventions beyond sort of a, a minimalist approach to monetary policy create winners and losers. And so on what basis is the Fed choosing winners and losers? So to, to sketch out a really simple scheme and how it would work, imagine that the Fed just set the interest rate on reserves. It, it jettisoned the Fed funds rate target. It shut down this repo facility. It, just, it shut down the overnight RRP facility, reverse repo facility. And it just set the interest rate on reserves. Moreover, all it held were short-term treasury securities, nothing but bills, bills only. And the Fed actually operated this way in the 1950s. That's what the policy was. Now, everything else the Fed does is a, a variation on this. And you can ask yourself, well, relative to this simple benchmark, what value does it add? So what value does it add for the Fed to buy longer-term Treasury securities rather than 
just stick to bills only and let the market determine the relative yields on short and longer term treasury security. What value does it add to intervene in the RP market on either side, either you know buying or selling um, RPs? What difference does it make for spreads? Doesn't that make some people better off? Doesn't it make some people worse off? What's the economic rationale for that? Now, the, the thing you're going to hear is uh, an analysis that involves the word, chances are, dysfunction. Now, the thing I'd point out is that dysfunction isn't really an economic term. It's a medical term. I mean, it's, it's, it's something about a lack of health. I mean, in, in markets, things happen, right? So in September of 2019, repo rates spiked on one day. Well, supply and demand drove repo rates up one day. Is that a malfunction or was the market responding the way you'd expect a good, efficient market to respond to some disturbance that occurred that day? And it's not at all obvious that those responses weren't relatively efficient adaptation. But by the Fed sort of pathologizing things like that and calling them dysfunction, it you know anything labeled dysfunction in the Fed is implicitly an object of intervention. A market that displays dysfunction is something that you know within the Fed it's sort of taken as gospel that if it's dysfunctioning we can make it better. But it's never been clear to me that the Fed staff is has a clear idea of the way in which we're making anything more efficient. Usually we're intervening in a way that makes some people better off and other people worse off. And the way I was taught about efficiency is that that doesn't change efficiency. It just makes some people better off and some people worse off. So that's the question we have about this complicated structure. What's wrong with a very simple structure with just interest rate on reserves? Banks can hold reserves. They can operate in these other markets. They operate in the RP market on both sides. They operate in loan markets. They operate in deposit markets. It's the arbitrage and competition of the interaction, the relationship between the interest they earn on deposits with the Fed and these other interest rates. That's the thing that lets the Fed influence a broad range of interest rates. But I, while the Fed has a strong view on what the nominal overnight interest rate on reserves ought to be, I don't think it has a, a strong analytical basis for taking a point of view on what these spreads should be. And I think they should you know, back off and let the spreads do, do what they do. If there's some peculiarity about how spreads behave due to some regulatory constraints, leverage ratios, for example, or the way reserves or some other asset are treated in you know, the living will resolution planning process or in liquidity regulation. It, if, if you think those regulations are bollocksing up the market and making the, the spread wrong, well, change the regulations. You must think the regulations are, are, are at fault. Beyond that, I don't see any fundamental market failure going on uh, in the markets that determine the spread. So yeah, I, I'm just baffled by, by the, the way the Fed thinks about these things. Well, I appreciate your embrace of markets and letting them speak through price signals. But let, let me again provide what would probably be the other side here and get your response to it. So two things, I think. Uh, one would be, okay, let the banks you know, be this conduit, give them the interest on reserves as the interest rate and everything else kind of works out. But, but the critique might be, the problem is all these new regulations since 2009, Dodd-Frank, all the Basel agreements, they have really reduced the balance sheet size of these banks and the role they can play as, as you know, market makers, intermediaries. So they can't do as much as they once could. And therefore, these other you know, money market funds, all these other things are entities are stepping in. And so the, the Fed has to be mindful because of regulations. The Fed's hands are tied to some extent because of regulations affecting, you know, bank balance sheet capacity. And then I, I think maybe a more broad point that maybe, maybe kind of captures that, that point is just that we live in a world with a global dollar system. We have, you know, we have shadow banking across the world. We have dollar markets across the world. 
And and things can happen over there that affect dollar markets back home. And so the Fed has to have all these other facilities open to step in, you know, to, to play that role. So it's 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 not as easy as it was, say, in 1950 or even, you know, maybe pre-2008. Uh, how would you respond to those observations? Well, presumably the, that web of regulations around, you know, liquidity management at uh, the large banks Presumably, they're there for a good reason. And if they're not well calibrated, recalibrate them. If they are well calibrated, well, the price of doing business may lead to some spread between the interest rate on reserves and and other market rates, uh, rates and markets that banks interact with. But if that spreads due to some regulatory cost, it it's like a marksman shooting across the wind. And taking into account that, yeah, the wind bends the shot a bit, so you got to aim a little to the right and take into account that it's going to go there. So that, you know, if if something adds a, a measure between IOER and IOR and, and repo rates, well, adjust IOR, you know, just change what you said IOR to. There's nothing you can't kind of pull back into the policy process. So that doesn't seem to me like a real strong argument against a simple approach. Okay. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Jeff Lacker. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the program. Pleasure, Dave. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings.